afternoon is portfolio questions and the portfolio this afternoon is net zero and just transition. We will suspend briefly. Huh? I did think that my voice was not as loud as normal, so thank you, Mr. Fraser, for the gesticulation. Um, so, yes, the portfolio this afternoon is net zero and just transition. As ever, I would appreciate brief uh, questions and succinct answers to match to get in as many members as possible. And at question number one, I call Ros McCall. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve transport options in rural areas. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Our strategic transport projects review includes recommendations focused on rural areas, including connecting towns and villages, improving active travel on trunk roads, and investing in demand responsive transport to improve connectivity. However, we are already taking action. The Go High project has improved accessibility to integrated transport services in the Highlands. The Community Bus Fund and the toolkit of powers within the Transport Act will enable local authorities to pursue options that best meet their needs, including the distinct challenges that rural areas face. And this year's record active travel funding will support new projects for rural communities. Ros McCall. I thank the Minister for that response. Bus services are a vital lifeline for local communities, especially in rural areas. A constituency in my region with poor mobility used to take the 27A bus from Dunfermline to Kirkcaldy to collect her prescription. This service has been cancelled, which makes it even more difficult for her to get her much-needed medicine. Due to the Scottish Government's decision not to extend the Network Plus grant, plus, Network Support Grant Plus, excuse me, fares have risen by an average of 15% across East Scotland, and local services in Fife are projected to be cut by a further 10%. So, can I ask the Minister, will the Scottish Government publish its Fair Fares Review before the summer recess of 2023, or will my rural constituents continue to suffer additional route cuts and increased costs? Minister. Um, President Officer, the Network Support Grant Plus uh, was uh, a package that we put in place uh, to help bus operators during the course of the COVID pandemic when there was a real impact on services. Um, it was not designed to be a permanent fixture, but was to de deal with that emergency uh, period. Um, President Officer, we will continue to work in partnership with bus operators uh, and local authorities uh, to create the best possible service that we can. Um, the Network Support Grant will continue to provide support to the bus industry in 2023-2024. Uh, this is paid per kilometre travelled, targeting support to the longer and less commercially viable routes uh, in rural and island communities. Uh, and in terms of our Fair Fares review, uh, we will publish that uh, in the near future. Uh, as Ms McCall and others will understand, uh, this is a hefty piece of work uh, that we want to get right for all of the people of Scotland. And supplementary, Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware that the former Deputy First Minister agreed with Orkney Islands Council to establish a task force to look at the replacement of the ferries operating on Orkney's uh, lifeline internal routes. Um, since the election of the new First Minister, uh, proposed meetings of the task force have not taken place. I'm not aware of uh, alternative dates having been set. So if, I'd be very grateful if the Minister could advise when the task force is next due to meet and what assurances he can give that this will remain on the radar of the Cabinet, uh, given that the Deputy First Minister is no longer in post. Minister. Uh, President Officer, the task force will be chaired by the new Deputy First Minister, Shona Robeson, um, and I will update Mr MacArthur uh, when we have dates in place for the first meeting. Uh, what I would say to Mr MacArthur uh, and to members uh, is that we recognise the importance of the work of that task force. Uh, I intend to go to Orkney uh, in the very near future, and as Mr MacArthur is, uh, is aware, um, I have had uh, a couple of meetings with the Council uh, in recent times, and I hope um, that uh, the cooperation and collaboration that we have in place uh, will continue. And supplementary, Matt Ruskell. Scotland's rural communities have great ideas on how to improve our national rail network. At the moment, ScotRail services pass through Newburgh, but have not stopped there since the station closed in 1955. A simple low-cost modular station could reconnect Newburgh to the rail network. 
So can I ask what discussions has the Minister had about the opportunities provided by these modular stations? And will the Minister agree to meet with me and the Newborough Rail Station campaign in the months to come? Minister. Uh, President Officer, I haven't had uh, any discussions about uh, modular stations per se uh, in the short time that I have been in uh, post. Uh, but I understand that Transport Scotland officials are already engaged with SESTRAN uh, on their appraisal of the Newborough area and have offered a meeting. However, it should be noted that modular stations um, are not suitable for all locations. Uh, but as always, I'm happy to have further discussions uh, with Mr Rusko and constituents uh, on these matters. Question number two, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to a recent report by Changeworks which found that homes in rural areas have a lower energy performance certificate rating than the rest of Scotland. Minister Patrick Harvey. I would like to express my thanks to Changeworks for their work in this area and for bringing forward this important report. The average energy performance certificate rating of rural properties is lower than those in urban areas because of the typically more expensive fuels used or available how these are reflected in the current EPC metric uh, and the historically lower energy efficiency standards. We are proposing that all housing in Scotland meet the equivalent of EPC C by 2033 and that we revise EPC metrics. Uh, we offer support to improve the energy efficiency of rural homes, including a funding uplift to our Home Energy Scotland grant and loan scheme uh, and targeted fuel poverty support. Liz Smith. Uh, can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer? He knows that improving energy efficiency in rural and in off-grid homes is absolutely critical for reducing energy bills and also meeting net zero targets. <coughs> but as the ChangeWorks uh, report makes very clear, the SNP's heat pump approach does not suit many of the older properties in the rural economy. So can I ask what the SNP is doing to encourage investment in alternative heating solutions such as biofuel LNG? Minister. Well, we uh, are working on policy in the area of biofuels in line with the UK Climate Change Committee's recommendations, which see some role but uh, recognise that there will be limits to the, the role of bioenergy uh, in the heating system. Meanwhile, we do provide, as I said earlier in my, my first answer, an uplift to the grant and loan schemes for rural areas. Uh, and in particular, we need to ensure that we're investing in the skills and capacity in the industry. Uh, just to give one example, we've invested in a mobile training centre for heat pump installation. Uh, it's being hosted by South Lanarkshire College, but available to any college in Scotland uh, for training uh, in rural areas on site. And that, I think, will help to make sure uh, that local uh, communities do have access uh, to skilled professionals who are able to assess uh, and install uh, heat pumps in all types of buildings. A supplementary, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last April, the Scottish Government estimated that there were more than 874,000 households in fuel poverty in Scotland, but its insulation and energy efficiency uh, scheme has now closed to applications until October. At the current rate of progress, it would take 165 years to insulate every fuel poor household in Scotland. So can the Scottish Government explain what has gone wrong? Minister. Uh, something has gone very right in that we are replacing uh, that scheme with a much improved successor. Uh, while that uh, transition happens, uh, new referrals will be uh, referred on to the, uh, the uh, provider under the terms of the successor scheme uh, rather than the, uh, the, the less generous terms of the, the previous scheme. Uh, I know that the member and other constituency and regional members representing rural and uh, indeed island communities uh, have repeatedly expressed their concerns uh, and I think that the Scottish Government's heat and building programme uh, is the most ambitious uh, of any uh, in any other part of, uh, of these islands, certainly, uh, and is looking to achieve the same kind of investment in a sustainable, equitable uh, and uh, uh, system that's, that's insulating people from fuel poverty, uh, comparable to what some of the best countries in Europe have achieved in previous decades. Question number three, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the role that it anticipates that the low carbon and renewables sector will play in the transition to net zero, including on any relevant discussions that took place at the recent All Energy Conference in Glasgow. Minister Gillian Martin. 
Thank you, President Officer. The low carbon and renewable sector plays an essential role in delivering Scotland's net zero ambitions. The draft Energy Strategy and Just Transition Plan sets out a vision for an energy system that delivers affordable, resilient and clean energy supplies. The First Minister, myself and three other government ministers attended the All Energy Conference and we had constructive discussions with a range of energy companies and other stakeholders. The First Minister particularly re-emphasised this government's commitment to the Scottish cluster and the importance of an early and positive decision from the UK Government on CCUS in Scotland. Jackie Dunbar. Uh, I thank the Minister for Energy for that answer. In the First Minister's speech to the All Energy Conference, he spoke about the flaws in the current transmission network charging system. What discussions has the Scottish Government had with the UK Government about fixing the methodology used, which, as it stands currently, is a potential barrier to supporting our renewable sector? Minister. I thank Jackie Dunbar for that, that assessment, and it's something that comes up practically in every single meeting I have with every single stakeholder. The Scottish Government has repeatedly called for a change to the current system of transmission network use of system charges, and my officials are in regular contact with Ofgem in this, this matter. I'm pleased that Ofgem has now reconvened the TNUOS uh, task force, as this was delayed to allow Ofgem to focus on the issue of security of supply over winter. However, the fact of the matter remains that a new approach is needed here, rather than small modifications to methodologies, and we will continue to raise this with Ofgem and our counterparts in the UK Government to push for a fairer solution that recognises the renewable capabilities of Scotland, because we need to do everything we can to maximise Scotland's potential to power the nation using low emissions technology, harnessing our substantial natural resources, and we need to do it in a way that creates economic prosperity for communities and businesses, and in the end, supplies the households, our households in Scotland with cleaner, cheaper power, the cheaper power that they so desperately need and want. I have uh, three members seeking to ask a supplementary. I intend to take all three. Uh, first, uh, supplementary from Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, the government's transition of North Sea workers to offshore windrolls has delivered only 3,100 positions in Scotland. Now, I've discovered that the government doesn't even break that data down to understand where those jobs are located. So it can't even say if a single worker in the North East is part of the transition. So can I ask the Energy Minister, when does the government intend to start collating and interrogating data properly and thus provide a more realistic and rigorous assessment of its failure to deliver a just transition? Minister. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, Mr Kerr's asks in this because I think I just issued a parliamentary answer to his written question on this. As it stands at the moment, we don't have that granular data, but there, is, there are methods afoot in the government to actually look at actually collating the data and producing it in such a way as, as has been requested. But that work is ongoing. And supplementary, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I put it on record? My apologies for cutting it fine for my arrival today. Thank you. Um, Minister, given the fantastic opportunities highlighted at the All Energy Conference and the need to tackle both the cost of living crisis and the climate crisis, what discussions has the Minister got planned with COSLA to support local authorities to deliver council and community cooperatively led heat and power schemes, given the huge benefits they could deliver to our constituents? Minister. This actually came up in discussion yesterday with the onshore uh, wind strategy leadership group. Um, we, we absolutely have to engage COSLA in looking at how we can actually support communities to actually uh, look at uh, shared ownership in particular. Um, we're doing a, a a number of pieces of work in that area, um, actually taking advice from the council, that the, the strategic leadership group that I just mentioned, who actually were working that actively yesterday in their, their, their uh, um, quarterly meeting. Um, I, I don't think that we can actually do this without the help of, 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 of COSLA and our local government partners. So I'm really keen to have that conversation with our, our, our our colleagues in COSLA quite soon, but what I want to do is I want to wait on some of the advice that's coming from the group that I mentioned so that I can make those, uh, those conversations more constructive and actually have a, a, a real secure plan in place to see how we can maximise the opportunities that we've got in communities, but we can also learn the lessons from communities that have already made that leap so that we can make that more efficient. And supplementary, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the just transition to net zero will require significant levels of investment 
to deliver its ambitions, including, of course, public as well as private sector investment. And I was encouraged with my, uh, by my discussions with investors when I spoke at uh, the Oil Energy Conference uh, the other week. So I can ask what work is the Scottish Government doing to leverage in capital investment for infrastructure and business growth opportunities to deliver the net zero transition? Minister. Pretty much every stream of work that has been done in the energy area is going to be a mix of uh, public sector support, government support, but also leveraging in that capital from private investors as well. What we need to signal as a government is that those private investors are going to be putting that money in the right, the right areas. I'm working closely with Scottish Enterprise in this area. Um, Ivan McKee will know how important they are in actually signalling that the, um, the private sector investment, where the government's goals are in that area and where we can actually get confidence in certain areas. Um, I'll be able to break, I mean, if, if Ivan McKee he wanted to write to me specifically, I could actually break that down into the individual pieces of information that he may require. Question number four, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it anticipates the impact of the Green Jobs Fund will be on the Kilmarnock and Irvin Valley constituency. Cabinet Secretary Mary McCallum. Uh, presiding officer, the Green Jobs Fund aims to create green employment, drive economic growth and support businesses to transition to a low carbon economy through capital investment in equipment and premises and research and development. Discussions on projects that could be supported by the fund in Ayrshire are underway, potentially creating hundreds of new jobs in the area. Uh, and as future Green Job Fund awards are made, I will, we will continue to update on the progress of the fund and the expected green jobs resulting from it. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? I can tell her that East Ayrshire has launched their Net Zero Accelerator programme with partners and employers to focus on gaining the knowledge on how best to move to net zero and how also to gain the skills and accreditation for this too. And does the Minister agree that it is vital that every part of Scotland both participates and benefits from the transition to net zero, particularly through vehicles like the Green Jobs Fund? And can she give my constituents an assurance that the Government will assist in any way it can to build that capacity locally as we strive to make the important transition in every community in Scotland? Um, Presiding officer, Willie Coffey makes an excellent point. The, the scale of the climate and nature crises, the pace with which we as a, as a society need to move to make the change commensurate with that challenge, uh, means that progress must absolutely be built from communities, for communities and within communities. Only then can the quite transformational change that's required in the coming years and decades uh, be delivered at the scale required and be sustainable. And I want to give my commitment to Willie Coffey and to his constituents that the government are dedicated to working with them as we take that journey. Question number five, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Net Zero Secretary has had with Ministerial College colleagues regarding how a seven million of grants allocated through the Hydrogen Innovation Scheme will support Scotland's low carbon economy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, I regularly engage with uh, ministerial colleagues on exactly that point, maximising the economic opportunities of net zero, and that, of course, includes our drive to reach five gigawatts of installed hydrogen production capacity by 2030. Uh, we have backed up that ambition by grants totalling over £7 million, which have been offered to 32 Scottish projects through our hydrogen innovation scheme and these will advance innovative solutions to scaling up hydrogen production, storage and distribution. And this is something that I was able to highlight to industry stakeholders at the Aberdeen Grampian Chambers of Commerce earlier this week that this funding, together with our Just Transition Fund, together with the Energy Transition Fund, is demonstrating our commitment to supporting Scotland's fair, prosperous and speedy transition. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. H105 is a first-of-a-kind demonstration project that is leading the way in decarbonising home heating, providing evidence for future low-carbon policy decisions and a clear pathway towards net-zero heating for Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that hydrogen is a promising opportunity as we look to transition from fossil fuels and decarbonising home heating? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do agree. We, we absolutely know that hydrogen will be a key part of our journey to net zero and complementary to electricity will play a role in industrial decarbonisation, transport and potentially heating some homes and building. Um, the SGN H105 neighbourhood trial, for example, will feed into this work, as will other large village and town trials in the UK. 
The H105 project is currently under construction, which aims to fit 100% hydrogen boilers into 300 homes in Leven. The project, I understand, is scheduled to go live in 2024 and operate until March 27, and the Scottish Government has gladly provided £6.9 million worth of grant funding to the project. Supplementary, Brian Hutto. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I know the Cabinet Secretary agrees with me that we have a fantastic opportunity to be world-leading in the green hydrogen economy, but we are behind the curve behind Germany, Holland, Belgium, Middle East and the USA. So what will the, government, the Scottish Government do to ensure that the red tape that is being reported to me from business to access that pump, uh, uh, prime, uh, pump prime funding that she, she, uh, she mentioned for early stage hydrogen uh, companies within uh, will, will in turn will, um, release further money from uh, private investment to make sure we fully realise our hydrogen potential. Uh, before I ask the Cabinet Secretary to respond, I would remind all members that they are required to be here for the start of proceedings should they wish to com uh, contribute to the proceedings. And if they wish to contribute to the proceedings, they should therefore apologise before they make their contribution. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. We um, are absolutely, uh, we recognise the potential that Scotland has in hydrogen, and we are committed to doing everything that we possibly can uh, to maximise the realisation of that. That includes uh, our hydrogen action plan, but we're not just planning. It's supported by £100 million of capital funding, which is designed to accelerate and maximise the production of renewable hydrogen in Scotland for use in Scotland. But I should also say that analysis suggests a very large uh, hydrogen export opportunity for Scotland, uh, with some estimates uh, thinking that there could be between 70,000 to over 300,000 jobs protected or created, and a, a GVA impact of those export scenarios ranging from £5 billion to £25 billion per annum by 2045. The Scottish Government is doing everything we can to realise those opportunities. We very much need the UK Government to do their part and to act with the speed that we are demonstrating in order to realise that fully. Question number six has been withdrawn. Question number seven, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans for Scottish carbon credits, including how it ensures benefits for local communities. Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is uh, committed to establishing a values-led, high-integrity market for responsible private investment in our natural capital, and this is as set out in the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. This commitment includes uh, the voluntary carbon market, uh, as backed up by the Committee on Climate Change, and is supported by our interim principles for responsible investment in natural capital. These principles set out that investment should deliver integrated land use, should provide public, private and community benefit, should demonstrate engagement and collaboration, have ethical and be values led, be of high environmental integrity and support diverse and productive land ownership. And these are Scottish Ministers' expectations of those who would uh, invest in our natural capital. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply? But isn't it the case that far from protecting community interests in achieving net zero, the SNP Green Government has embarked on an exercise in privatising our nature and opening up carbon credits to speculators and giant corporations to asset strip, cash in, make all the gains and so widen the wealth inequality gap even further? They include Fleet Corps, which sells fuel cards to the road haulage industry, the oil giant Shell, defence companies like Talis, banks like Barclays. How is that green sustainable or even in the national interest? How is that values led? Is this what equality, opportunity, community looks like under this SNP Green Government? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding officer, quite the opposite to the narration uh, from Richard Leonard. This is about the Scottish Government recognising that our natural capital is an exceptionally valuable asset to our people and to our environment. It's about recognising that there are many interventions that we need to take in our natural environment which will help us rise to the climate and nature emergency and have other co-benefits including uh, good green jobs in rural areas. But the public purse can never and will never fund those interventions alone. So we are dedicating ourselves to, as Ms Martin set out, leveraging necessary private investment, but doing so in a pioneering way, I've got to say, and in a way that is values-led, high integrity, which is additional, verifiable, and which benefits uh, the people of this country. And I've got to say that sits alongside the development of an ambitious land reform bill 
and continued investment in the Scottish Land Fund, which is helping communities throughout the country buy land and assets in their local areas and put them to local use. And supplementary, Maurice Golden. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Pension and hedge funds are engaged in the carbon market, similar to the position on the deposit return scheme, where the SNP Greens decided to award a multi-million pound waste collection contract to an American hedge fund. Mm -hmm. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm to Parliament that it is SNP Green policy to develop new initiatives in order to benefit multinational hedge funds? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, Presiding Officer, that is not this government's motivation. As I've just narrated in response to Richard Leonard, our motivation is seeking to harness the opportunities that we have in abundance in Scotland in a way which helps us to rise to the climate and nature emergency, but equally in a way that empowers our people to benefit from the schemes and the developments that we'll have uh, that will happen in the communities around them. And I, I refer Maurice Golden back to those principles for responsible investment in natural capital. These are pioneering principles. They are being referred to by other organisations and countries who are trying now to do likewise. And they state very clearly Minister's expectations. And I would refer him to, uh, him, him to them on ethical and values-led investment, on high environmental uh, integrity, on public, private and community benefit, and... I'd be more than happy to furnish Maurice Golden with evidence of how these are now being utilised by those who are investing in Scotland. Question number eight, Fulton McGregor, who's joining us remotely. Uh, Mr McGregor, uh, we now have you. Could you please start your question again? Thank you. Ms. McGregor, could you please unmute? Okay, Ms. McGregor, I think we have you now. Please start. Apologies again, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Scottish Zero Emission Bus Challenge Fund is supporting change in the bus sector in light of Scotland's net zero ambitions. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Last week I launched the second and final phase of the Challenge Fund while visiting Alexander Dennis and Larbert. Uh, the Scottish Government is offering up to £58 million to transform the market for zero emission buses on top of the previous investment of over £113 million in zero emission buses. It is clear that the market is now at a pivotal point uh, and with the money I am offering the sector uh, could make the zero emission bus market self-sustaining, enabling uh, bus and coach operators of all types and sizes to achieve the zero emissions over the coming years. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that response. Bus transport is crucial to many of our communities and services such as the recently reintroduced CityLink 902 service provide a vital link in my constituency to city centres. Initiatives like Scott ZEB and the transformational under 22 bus pass will be crucial to ensuring that Scotland's bus sector is at the heart of the modal shift we need to see away from cars as we strive for net zero. Can I therefore ask the Minister what level of support the Scottish Government has already provided via Scott ZEB and how many buses this has provided? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and uh, I should note uh, the campaigning efforts of Mr McGregor and, and Neil Gray uh, on the City Lake 902 that he, he spoke of. The Government awarded £62 million through the first phase of Scott's EB, helping operators acquire 276 battery electric buses uh, and, of course, the associated charging infrastructure. That's over and above the £52 million uh, capital uh, that we've put in previously, plus a resource commitment uh, worth up to £20 million that we provided through our previous fund to support 272 battery electric buses and, again, that infrastructure. Um, we are helping the bus se sector decarbonise. Uh, we are encouraging more people uh, to choose bus and to take fewer journeys by cars. Uh, and alongside that, uh, we have seen over 62 million free bus, bus journeys made by young people across Scotland since the introduction of our Young Persons uh, Scheme. This is all good news. 
uh, for the people of Scotland. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes portfolio questions on net zero and just transition. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to change position should they wish. Thank you.